The saga of Dorian Hawkmoon is one of the best known and most beloved of Michael Moorcock's Tales of the Eternal Champion. The first part of Hawkmoon's story is known as the History of the Rune Staff, a tetralogy of four short novels comprising The Jewel in the Skull, The Mad God's Amulet, The Sword of the Dawn, and The Rune Staff. They were written between 1967 and 1969, while Moorcock was still a young man in his 20s. Those four novels are collected in the third volume of the omnibus editions of the Eternal Champion series published by White Wolf Publishing in the US and by Millennium Orion in the UK. In my previous Eternal Champion video, I discussed the stories of John Dacre and various members of the Von Beck family, who were the focus of the first two volumes of those omnibus editions. Those previous volumes are very different from this third one in several ways. For one thing, the stories they contain are only loosely connected to one another and don't tell a continuous narrative. In contrast, the four Hawkmoon novels in this volume form a single continuous story that can be thought of as one long novel. Also, Moorcock's writing style is quite different in these Hawkmoon novels. Where the Von Beck and John Dacre novels clearly fall into specific genres, either fantasy or science fiction, Hawkmoon's story in the history of the Rune Staff is kind of a hybrid a dystopian science fiction and fantasy blend that has its roots in science fiction, but reads more like sword and sorcery fantasy with a steampunk vibe. His stylistic influences are also somewhat different. I've mentioned previously that Moorcock is a literary chameleon, able to imitate the writing styles of a wide range of authors and subgenres. In the John Dacre and Von Beck stories, he seems to celebrate the writing styles of authors ranging from Robert Louis Stevenson to Lord Dunsany to Clark Ashton Smith, among others. For the Hawkmoon stories, his inspiration seemed to be the swashbuckling planetary romances of Edgar Rice Burroughs, the Hyborian tales of Robert E. Howard, and the dying Earth stories of Jack Vance. The four novels in the history of the Rune Staff follow Dorian Hawkmoon a German nobleman in a post-apocalyptic future Earth who simply wants to defend his people against an invading evil empire that wants to conquer the world. But he soon finds himself on a quest to fulfill his destiny as an eternal champion, striving to restore the balance between the cosmic forces of order and chaos. The evil empire he's fighting is none other than the remnants of Great Britain, now known as Grand Britain which has rebuilt itself following the destructive but unspecified events of the tragic millennium, which caused most of the world to regress to a pre-industrial and somewhat medieval and piratical state of affairs. Grand Britain has emerged as a new industrial power with expansionist goals and now threatens the peace-loving kingdoms and duchies of what was once continental Europe. Moorcock's world-building of Grand Britain is both fun and clever, as well as a little disturbing. There are clear parallels to World War II, but this time Britain is the brutal aggressor, while Germany, represented by Hawkmoon, is Europe's last best hope to avoid total conquest or annihilation. It's set far enough in the future that Moorcock can get away with introducing some far-fetched social customs and technologies, but it's still close enough to our time that vague and sometimes humorous echoes of our modern world shape the beliefs and mythologies of Grand Britain. For example, there are sly references to the ancient gods of Grand Britain, Jon, Fowl, Jorg, and Runga, who were greatly feared when they ruled the land with iron fists millennia earlier. We know them as John, Paul, George, and Ringo, and other historical figures from our era, as well as some of Moorcock's literary friends and colleagues, appear in the future mythologies. Moorcock uses the role reversals from World War II to illustrate the corrupting influence of power and the impermanence of the balance between order and chaos in which good can become evil and vice versa. In World War II, which the Von Beck stories cover to an extent, Great Britain represents a positive law and order influence in the battle against the chaotic and destructive evil of Nazi Germany. Millennia later though, Grand Britain is still aligned with the law and order side of the balance but it has taken it to such an extreme that it has transformed from being a force for good to one of evil. At the same time, Germany's alignment with chaos has become a positive influence, providing the life-affirming independence and freedom of thought and action that Grand Britain seeks to stifle. Grand Britain has inherited the rigid class structure of the earlier Great Britain, 
but now expresses it in the form of a hierarchical and bureaucratic system of guilds, the members of which wear elaborate masks in public in the form of totemic animals that identify their guild membership. The masks also provide a degree of anonymity to members of Grand Britain society, which makes me wonder if Moorcock was using that anonymity to represent the banality of evil described by German political philosopher Hannah Arendt. There are also some significant echoes of Grand Britain in George Lucas's portrayal of the Empire in the Star Wars universe. It's what I picture in my mind's eye when I read these books. It's possible, though, that the similarities are merely coincidental because Lucas and Moorcock were similarly inspired by the stories in early pulp magazines. The tale of Dorian Hawkmoon is at the center of the novels as he battles the oppressive evil of Grand Britain. Early in the first novel, he's captured by Grand Britain and forced to act as a spy on its behalf as an emissary to the castle fortress of Count Brass in what was once the south of France. Castle Brass is one of the last bastions of former Europe to remain free of Grand Britain's control, and Hawkmoon is ordered to infiltrate it and kidnap the Count's daughter. Grand Britain is able to secure Hawkmoon's obedience via an advanced technological device it has embedded in his forehead in the form of a jewel. The jewel relays everything Hawkmoon sees and hears back to Grand Britain, and if he fails to follow orders, it has the power to kill him by literally melting his brain. Count Brass discovers the nature of the mind control being exerted over Hawkmoon, and he manages to temporarily disable the jewel, giving Hawkmoon a few months of freedom in which to seek a permanent cure for the jewel in his skull. The rest of the four novels follows Hawkmoon on his quest to disable the jewel and to live happily ever after with his one true love, the daughter of Count Brass. Along the way, he makes new friends and enemies, and travels around the globe and even into parallel dimensions in search of the people and powerful artifacts that will bring him closer to fulfilling his destiny as an eternal champion. Beyond that, I won't say much more because I want to avoid spoilers. The Hawkmoon character seems to have been inspired in part by John Carter and Carson Napier, the heroes of Edgar Rice Burroughs' Barsoom and Venus science fantasy books, as well as by Robert E. Howard's Conan and Solomon Kane. He's not a fully fleshed out character, but his strong personal convictions and motivations propel the narrative forward from one exciting episode to the next as he seeks knowledge and powerful magical or technologically advanced artifacts that he can use to defeat Grand Britain, and at various times to rescue his friends and his lady love. And episodes is a good word to describe how the novels are structured, they're highly episodic, emphasizing fast-paced plot development and plot contrivances that place Hawkmoon and other key characters in dire situations on a regular basis from which escape seems impossible, requiring creative problem-solving, more than a little luck, and perhaps some divine intervention. I really enjoy these stories, but they also frustrate me. For one thing, given their short length, it feels like there's too much packed into them. They're so fast-paced, jumping from one locale and set of characters to another in rapid succession that the story doesn't have time to breathe. And as a reader, I never get a chance to fully savor Moorcock's creative world-building. For example, I really enjoy the concept of Grand Britain, but as is often the case with Moorcock's fictional worlds, it's left incomplete. He teases the readers with some terrific ideas and images associated with it, but then he doesn't fully develop them. He seems to be in too much of a hurry to move on to the next plot elements, which dominate the stories at the expense of character development and world building. Many of the characters feel like props introduced simply to further the plot. And speaking of the plot, it gets pretty repetitive, both within and across the four books in the Tetralogy. The settings change, but the basic action tends to follow a recursive pattern. Hawkmoon travels to a new and strange location, sometimes accompanied by companions. He gets captured, he escapes with help from unforeseen friends, and then the sequence repeats itself as he travels to a new strange location. That's roughly the same successful formula Burroughs used in many of his pulpy adventure novels, such as his Barsoom books, which I'll add can be very light and enjoyably diverting reads, but that formula can also get a little tiring. Moreover, several of Hawkmoon's escapes in these books have a deus ex machina aspect to them involving the intercession of supernatural representatives of the balance or the use of extremely powerful magical or technological talismans. 
At times, some of those plot resolutions are a little too convenient and make Hawkmoon's role as the Eternal Champion seem less consequential than I'd like. On balance, though, this is a very fun series of novels that can be highly enjoyable if you approach it with the right expectations. There's enough creativity in this short series to fill a more conventional series of fantasy or science fiction novels four times its length. The plot moves quickly and provides some connection points to other parts of the Eternal Champion saga, including Elric's story and another trilogy of Hawkmoon novels collected in a later volume under the title Count Brass that is sometimes thought of as the conclusion to the entire Eternal Champion saga. But the seriousness of the cosmic consequences at stake doesn't quite mesh with the pulpy, swashbuckling style of these first four Hawkmoon stories. And don't expect a fully immersive reading experience either, or a strong emotional payoff at the end. For me at least, Hawkmoon's History of the Rune Staff doesn't quite deliver on those levels. I hope you've enjoyed this brief spoiler-free review of the first four novels of one of Michael Moorcock's most iconic and beloved eternal champions, Dorian Hawkmoon. They're quick and engaging reads, and there's even a television series adaptation reportedly under development, although it remains to be seen whether it will actually come to fruition. My next installment in this series of videos about the Eternal Champion will be Volume 4, featuring the exploits of Oswald Bastable, the nomad of the time streams. Thanks for watching.